Which is the best premium family SUV? Is it the new Mercedes GLC or the not so new BMW X3 or the also not so new Audi Q5 and the also not so new but not German Volvo XC60? Let's find out. Buy, sell, car, wow. Let's start this video by talking about the prices. So each of these cars ranges kicks off at this much. Now the cars I've got here are all plug-in hybrids and the starting prices of the cars I've got on test are actually this much. And if you want to see how much you can save on each of these model ranges on average through CarWow, it is this much. Now, if you're thinking about buying a new car and you want to make sure you're paying a fair price for it, click on the pop-out banner up there or go to CarWow, okay? Because then you can compare offers and prices across a wide range of cars. Also, you can now sell your current car through CarWow. It's dead easy. All you have to do is upload some photos of your car, give a brief description, then dealers all across the country will bid on your car. If you want to do that at a later date, just simply Google Help Me CarWow and we will help you change your car. Even though the Audi Q5 is the least expensive of the cars in terms of its range starting price and the model I've got on test, you know, this is almost £60,000. Does it look worth £60,000? It's pretty smart. I like the overall design of the Q5. It's not offensive. It's not dull. It, it, it does a good job. This one has quite a lot of shiny bits on it which help lift it. And I like the blue paint. There is one thing though I cannot forgive about the Audi Q5. And I'm going to illustrate it now with a badly timed stick throw. Thanks. It's the fake exhaust. Look, look at that nonsense. Learn to time it properly. Sorry, you're supposed to catch that. I just twatted him in the face. <laughs> in comparison to the smart and classy Audi, the BMW looks a little bit too, yeah, look at me. Touch showy, isn't it? And I'd have to say, it's also slightly overdone. What's not overdone though, are the exhausts. No need for the stick of truth this time. It's got real exhaust. That's something going in its favor. Meanwhile, the Volvo doesn't have any exhaust, so I'm not needing the stick of truth. Though I'm gonna keep it with me because I think I might need it for the Mercedes. Before we get to that car though, I do think this Volvo is a very classy design. It has been around for a long time now, but I still like the look of it. And I think while it looks like the XC90, because it's a bit shorter than that car, the proportions are just about right. I also like it with the chrome trim, though you can get these bits in black. I don't recommend that. It just looks a bit more expensive when you go for the shiny shiny. Finally then, we come to the GLC. And just like the Audi, we've got some horrendous fake exhaust pipes. Shame really, because the rest of the car's design is spot on. Love the design of the rear. The side profile's really cool. The chrome really works. The running boards make it look expensive. So too do the alloy wheels. They're my favorite alloy wheels out of these four cars. Then at the front, it's got a similar kind of look at me vibe to it as the BMW, but the design is just, it's more cohesive. Yeah, I think overall, this looks like the most expensive car, but then again, it is the newest. So does it feel the newest on the inside? <laughs> There's going to be war. The GLC has quite a cool and interesting interior design in terms of the layout at the dash and the way you have this big central infotainment screen and this big digital driver's display. It all looks quite good and expensive. And generally, that's how it feels as well. Apart from a few bits, like that there, that there, and that bit there. Also, the stalks are a bit plasticky. Also, I'm not a huge fan of the touch-sensitive buttons on the steering wheel. It can be a bit hard to operate sometimes. That sort of lets it down ever so slightly. But other than that, it feels like a nice car to sit in. And you do really feel like you're sitting in it, the way you have this big center console here separating you from your passenger. Plus, it's got some cool ambient lighting in the air vents. So when you increase the temperature, you get red lighting. And when you decrease it, you get, yes, you guessed it, blue lighting. Tiny things, please, tiny minds. Considering the Volvo is the oldest car here, it doesn't really feel that dated. It's not as modern as the Mercedes, but it still looks very good with a minimalist design. But that's because most of the controls are done through this touchscreen, which is a little bit fiddly. Look at these icons. Look, 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 small, 
small icons. Also, the digital driver's display is not quite as fancy as in the Mercedes, but the rest of the car feels nice. I like the driftwood here on the dash. The materials are generally pretty good, though that's a bit scratchy there. However, this particular car has this crystal gear selector. That is really nice. Also, the damping of the switches feels expensive, more so than in the Mercedes, though the Mercedes does have a nicer steering wheel. And that's the thing that you really do spend most of your time touching in the car. You also spend a lot of your time touching the seats, but with your bottom. And I love these Volvo seats, so comfy, and they're especially nice when covered in this wall. Lovely. On the inside of the BMW, it does feel a bit more modern than the Volvo, but it's not as fancy as the Mercedes, though the quality overall does seem slightly better. It's quite easy to use all the functions as well, and I like the fact that you have climate controls which are separated from the infotainment system. Also, the infotainment system has a little control wheel, so you can actually use that instead of just having to use the touchscreen. You can decide. It's even got gesture control, so it'll do things when you wave your hands about. The digital driver's display is fairly clear, but it's a bit dark and miserable, a bit like in the Volvo. The driving position is good in this car, and generally, it is pretty nice. The question is though, is it as nice as the Audi? Do you know what? In terms of interior quality, it's very close between this and the BMW. Maybe the BMW slightly edges it, apart from the steering wheel, which is nicer in the Audi. Unlike in the BMW though, there's no swivel wheel to control the infotainment system. It's touchscreen only, like in the Mercedes, though it is very intuitive and I find it easier to use than the BMW system. Though the Mercedes is still slightly better. The digital driver's display is really nice and clear as well. And it's quite easy to just change your views on it as well. Not as in your point of view on it. You get what I mean. I also really like the fact that as in the BMW, you have your climate control separate from the touchscreen. And here, look, we actually have the temperature in the dial. That's cool. Yeah, also feels very spacious in here. Let's check out the back seats and see if it's the same story back there. Well, yeah, it's pretty spacious. Good knee room, good headroom, decent amount of foot space, and the seats feel really nice. Plus, look at this. I can recline them a little bit for extra comfort. And if I need more boot space, I can slide them forward. Hmm. What about when you carry three people at once? Well, this middle seat is narrower and it is a little bit higher than the two outer seats. So it feels a bit like a perch, but headroom's still okay. And even though there is this hump in the floor, there is just about enough room for everyone's feet. When it comes to fitting a child seat, very easy, even when fitting a bulky rear facing seat. The only slight issue is trying to get these covers off because it hurts your finger a little bit if you're weak like me. Ow. Here in the back of the X3, while well, knee room is good, headroom is good, there is one slight issue. While the seat base is really nice and deep, in this plug-in hybrid version, it seems like there's less depth to the footwells, so your knees are slightly higher, so there's less under thigh support than in this, the standard internal combustion engine versions, which is a shame, because other than that, it is quite a comfy car. You do have a bit of a hump, in the floor yet again, but the foot space is pretty decent, so there's enough room for everybody's feet. However, this middle seat doesn't feel quite as comfortable as in the Audi. When it comes to fitting a child seat, it's ever so slightly better than the Audi. Once again, lots of room for maneuvering a seat in, but these are fixed anchor points. They're easy to access. You can just push your bits in there. The seat bits. Let's move on quickly. Oh, I forgot to say, just like in the Audi, you can recline the seat backs a bit in the BMW, but there's no forward and backward slidey slidey. Now let's move on. There's no slidey slidey or recliney recliney in the back of the Volvo, unfortunately. Still, it is very, very comfortable back here. Lots of knee room, lots of head room. The seats are on the firm side, but in a good way, feel like they're supporting you. And you feel more like you're sitting on it than in it than in the BMW, and I quite like that. There's enough foot space, though not quite as much as in the BMW, but when you come to carrying three in the back at once, this middle seat is slightly better than either the Audi or the BMW. You're the same height as the two outer seats, 
there is a big hump in the floor yet again it seems like it's common on these kind of cars and it's no better or worse than any of its competitors one thing that's not so good about the volvo is trying to fit a child seat the way these seats actually arch out at the top means that it can be quite hard to maneuver a seat into place especially as the back doors don't open look all that wide really once you have maneuvered it into place fixing it to the ice fix anchor points is quite simple Finally then, the Mercedes, and there's a similar problem when you're fitting a child seat to this car as the Volvo, with the seat back tops that arch out and rear doors that don't open all that wide. Still, it's slightly better than with the Volvo, though not quite as easy to fit a child seat as in the BMW nor the Audi. Other than that though, really roomy, nice. Loads of knee room, decent headroom even with the panoramic glass roof. Nice amount of foot space as well, and you can really stretch out underneath the chair in front. And the foot wells are quite deep, so you have plenty of under thigh support as well. That's good. Where did they put the batteries? Where, where on earth? Because they've hidden them well throughout the car. Also, when it comes to carrying three in the back at once, the middle seat is the same height as the two outer seats, so you don't feel like you're sitting on a perch. And while there is this big hump in the floor, like in all the other cars, there's still plenty of foot space. Yeah. This is quite good for going long distances in the back. Nice and comfortable. The only thing that really bothers me is the climate controls in the rear. Sort of looks like a robot's face. It's that Bender from Futurama. Anyway, enough about carrying people in the back. What about carrying their luggage in the boot? Let's compare these cars' practicality. The BMW's luggage capacity is 550 litres. So too is the Mercedes GLC's. As is the Audi Q5s. The Volvo has the smallest boot. Its capacity is just 483 litres, but that doesn't tell the whole story. You see, these are plug-in hybrids, and so some of their boot space is taken up by batteries and motors underneath the floor. As a result, the Volvo's boot capacity in plug-in hybrid format is 468 litres. Not that much difference. Also, it's quite practical. I like the way that the headrests automatically fold down when you release the seat backs. And look, you see you have a nice flat load space when you fold the seats down. The hybrid system on the Audi eats into its boot capacity more. As a result, it has less load space than the plug-in hybrid version of the XC60. It's 465 litres. Now to fold down the rear seats, I just pulled these levers here. But the annoying thing about this car is that I have to then climb in to lock them into place. Moving on to the Mercedes. So it's got a big battery in it and that does affect the load space once again. That's why this plug-in hybrid version has a load capacity of 460 litres. I like the fact though that on this particular model, I can lower the rear seats by just pressing those little buttons there. What's less good is the fact that there's no separate guides for the seat belts, and sometimes they can get snagged. Finally though, we come to the car with the smallest boot capacity when you have the plug-in hybrid version. I mean, you can see the effect of it here. That's not great. The boot capacity on this particular car, it's 450 litres. Hmm. It's not all bad though. For instance, when I fold down the rear seats, there's no seat belt snagging. You get quite a flat load floor. And I also like this. It's the only car where there is actually space to store the load cover underneath the force floor. That's enough about practicality. Let's move on to power. Now all these cars have two liter turbocharged petrol engines mated to an electric motor. They also all have four wheel drive and automatic gearboxes, but their power outputs are slightly different. So the BMW is the least powerful. This xDrive 30e has 292 horsepower. The Audi Q5 50 TFSI E has 299 horsepower. However, the Mercedes GLC 300e has 320 horsepower, but Rather unexpectedly, the most powerful car here is the Swedish one. This Volvo XC60 T8 puts out an incredible 455 horsepower. Okay, let's launch these cars. 
So this plug-in hybrid version of the X3 has 292 horsepower. It's supposed to do 0 to 60 in 6.1. Will it beat that figure? Let's find out. It says launch control. It has a launch control. Did it help? 6.35 with launch control. Hmm. Okay, time for the Audi. Let's see what its 299 horsepower is able to do. Audi says 0 to 60 in 6.1 seconds. How close are we going to get to that? Hmm. Well, we got 5.52. That is an improvement on what they say. Wow. We come to the Mercedes, which is supposed to be the slowest, 0 to 60 in 6.7 seconds, despite having 320 horsepower, so more power than the Audi and the BMW. However, this car weighs more than those two and the Volvo. It comes in at almost 2.3 tonnes, so it's about 300 kilograms heavier than the other three cars. But let's see what the actual 0 to 60 time is. Here we go. I quite like the noise of that. It's the best sounding, sounds like a sports car. That's interesting, 6.26 seconds. So in reality, it was quicker than the BMW. Wasn't expecting that. Actually, I really like the performance of this thing. Not as quick as the Audi, but quick enough. Volvo says that this 455 horsepower XC60 should do 0 to 60 in 4.6 seconds. Let's see what it really does. Here we go. That feels pretty rapid, actually. Not quite 4.6, 4.79. Quick, really quick, actually, but not quite as quick as they said. Now let's compare how all these cars drive. Obviously, I'm gonna stay in the Volvo XC60, but I'm gonna go into normal hybrid driving mode. Oh God, it's hard to do this changing of driving modes while you're driving. They should just have a button you can press easily. Okay, so do you know what? This is quite a nice all-round car to travel in. So it's reasonably quiet. You do get a bit of road noise, a bit of wind noise. The engines are pretty strong. The diesel can be a bit noisy but the petrols are fine. And this plug-in hybrid obviously is very, very quiet when you're just running on electric power, which you can do for 48 miles apparently and up to 87 miles an hour. It's supposed to be able to give you like 288 miles per gallon, but what am I averaging? 31.2 over 191 miles. Hmm. The suspension is reasonably comfy. This has the upgraded air suspension. You do feel a few bumps in the road and get the odd shimmy through the cabin, but generally it's all right. One thing I really like is the turning circle. It's like 11.4 meters. It's not bad for a big car like this. Makes it nice and easy to maneuver around town. And the performance is pretty good from this 455 horsepower version. Handling wise, it grips quite well, but it does lean a bit in the corners. Obviously being the plug-in hybrid, it's heavier than the non-plug-in hybrid versions. So that does mean that the handling isn't quite as good and that was very scary. I'm surprised that the collision detection didn't like go crazy then. That was good because if it had suddenly braked, I could have been in trouble. I needed to be able to go round that lorry. Anyway, I'll continue with the review. Overall, this is a nice, solid, secure feeling car to drive that's comfy, handles well enough and pretty well does all that you need it to do. Set a good benchmark this, for which the others are going to be compared against. Let's grab the next car. Hopefully we're not going to have any more lorries just driving on the wrong side of the road. I've now jumped into the Audi Q5. Because like the Volvo, it was last updated in 2021. And I can tell you right away, this feels like a slightly better car to drive in pretty much every single way. So the suspension seems a little bit more composed, even though this is on just the basic normal springs and dampers and the Volvo was on air suspension. It seems to just cope with bumps better. And you can get this Audi with adapter adaptive dampers and air suspension, which will both make it increasingly better again. Then there's the handling. It will go around corners better than the Volvo. It just seems to hold onto the road better. You feel a bit more in tuned with it in terms of the steering and how it actually handles. There is one area where this car isn't quite so good as the Volvo though, and that's the turning circle. It's 11.8 meters, but really 40 centimeters, it's not really gonna change your world. And this is maneuverable enough. It really is. Another area this isn't quite as good as a Volvo is the electric only range. It's like 
39 miles and top speed's like 86 or something like that but you know all fine i'm going to show you something that is quite bad though let's do it yeah average economy 26.4 at the moment so it's to be like 180 or something but yeah plug-in hybrids they're all a bit of a lie in terms of their efficiency unless you're constantly charging them up at home that might not be as good as the volvo but the comfort levels are and it's more relaxing as well i think there's better sound insulation in this audi there's less wind noise a bit less road noise also the engines in the q5 are a little bit quieter like when you floor it doesn't make quite so much noise as the Volvo. I think the engine lineup is slightly better. And while this car might not have the power of that Volvo XE60, you can get a sportier SQ5 with a good old six cylinder internal combustion engine. Oh yeah. But really the big thing for me is that this can actually be quite good fun to drive when you want to go quickly. The gearbox is good. You've got paddle shifters as well if you want to change gears yourself. A seven speed dual clutch automatic gearbox. You know, racing cars have dual clutch automatic gearboxes, but it is just the whole package together, the way it blends comfort. Yeah, it has a sporty enough drive that you can have a little bit of fun when you throw it down a country road such as this. It really is the complete package. A bit like me. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit cringe, isn't it? I think we need to go into the next car because it is supposed to be the one that's designed for the sportiest drive, but I don't see how it can be better at handling than this Q5. I really don't, but let's find out. Okay, here we go then. The BMW X3, pure driving pleasure or whatever it's supposed to be there. BMW tagline, which basically says, our cars are more fun than your cars. And yeah. That goes around corners well. Noticeably better than the Audi? I think not, actually. In fact, I'm not sure whether it really is better. I, I slightly prefer the steering in the Audi. All right, let's, let's just go through another corner to be sure. One way, then the other. They should test it out. It certainly grips, oh, oh, wait, maybe. Maybe this does ever so slightly have the edge. Though somehow or other, the Audi just seems a bit more natural you feel more connected to the car. So while this one feels a bit more capable, the Audi is just a slightly nicer drive. Speaking of which, things did feel a bit bouncy then because this particular car has the adaptive dampers and when you go in sports mode, it stiffens them up and the ride can get a bit bouncy and jiggly. Though to be fair, it's better than when you don't have the adaptive dampers. This car can have slightly firm suspension especially if you have an M Sport version. The Audi is a more comfortable drive, and I think it's similar to the Volvo this, but with a more sporty edge rather than the Volvos just not being quite as sophisticated as the Audi, or probably not quite as sophisticated as this BMW. The gearbox is pretty good though. Sharp shifts, not as sharp as the Audi though, but then it does have a torque converter automatic gearbox, not a dual clutcher like the Q5. Right, turning circle, yeah, it's the worst so far 12 meters it is enough to just do a ue here though so that's fine i'm going to come out of that mode now that sporty mode and go into just normal it'll improve the ride yeah it's a bit better of a bumps now and it is better than the volvo though not quite as good as the audi i tell you what's also not quite as good as the audi but slightly better than the volvo and that sound insulation the problem with this car is that you get a bit more road noise than the q5 in terms of the hybrid in us this thing has averaged 32.3 miles per gallon, which is actually all right. Well, it's not all right, is it really? Considering it's supposed to do 109 miles to the gallon, but I guess it's closer to its claim figure than the other cars I've driven. <laughs> and it is generally a nice drive, this car. Though still, I think I prefer the Audi overall, especially as you can go slightly further on electric power load with the Audi. This one will only do like 31 miles, which is a bit of a shame, really. Sometimes you want to go quite a long distance on electric power. In fact, with some plug-in hybrids, you can basically just run them on electric power, like like an electric car and use the petrol motor just for more power or as like a range extender. And that brings me on to the final car. The Mercedes is actually the newest car here. So does it feel the most modern? Well, I'm actually gonna just check out its turning circle first, which is average. It's like 11.8, same as the Audi. So let's see. Please check your Mercedes resetting to use online functions of the voice system. You can't mention the M word while driving an M. The assistant always chimes in. 
yeah, it's annoying. What's less annoying is that if you're after a plug-in hybrid, really, this one just has way better stats than the other three cars. So the electric only range is 80 miles. That's like serious. You can run this car on electric only mode most of the time when you're just doing your normal little commute or errands or anything like that. The petrol motor is just a range extender really and for more power and the power is good. Sometimes it can take a wee while for the gearbox and the electric motor and the petrol engine to all work together to accelerate but the performance is strong and the electric motor really does help fill in the gap when you put your foot down. Now one of the problems with this car is that added weight. It does mean this car feels a little bit heavier to drive than the other three. It's a little bit odd, it disguises its weight very well for most of the time. So the suspension seems pretty compliant, doesn't feel like hard to steer, and it goes around corners really, really well surprisingly well considering how heavy it is but it's only when you really push it as hard as you can do in the Audi that this starts to just feel like oh my god it, it is quite heavy but you're not really going to be doing that unless you're a motoring journalist trying to assess the dynamic envelope of the car you're testing the suspension generally is good it's pretty quiet as well pretty much right up there with the Audi the petrol and diesel versions because they're lighter, they just go down the road a little bit better, but obviously you don't have that electric only capability of this one. And for me, really, I'm not the biggest fan of plug-in hybrids, but this is one of the few ones that I think really works because of that excellent range. And surely that ability to run on electric power for such a long distance should mean this car has a brilliant economy figure. And indeed, the claim figure is ace. It's like over 560 miles per gallon. But what is the reality? 37.2 miles per gallon. So better than the other cars, but not over 500 miles to the gallon. However, I think it's the way this has been driven. And in fact, all the other cars have been driven because I've been using their long-term ranges. And the fact is these cars have gone out to motoring journalists who've driven them quickly, haven't bothered to charge them because they're leaving flats in London, which is a place that plug-in hybrids are pointless. And um, as a result, their economy figures have been pretty terrible. But use this car correctly and you will get a good economy figure. Though I doubt you'll get anywhere near what Mercedes claims. So then, what's my final verdict? Well, these four cars are very closely matched, but if I've got to order them in my order of preference, fourth place, it's the Volvo. In third place, it's the BMW. In second place, it's the Audi. And the winner is the Mercedes. It's the newest car here, and it does feel the newest as well. And if you want a plug-in hybrid, this one with the far superior electric-only range is the one to have. And that's why it wins this test. I hope you'll enjoy the video. If you did, give it a like. Let me know which you think is the best car in the comments below. Click on those windows there for some more videos. And if you click on that box there, you can go to CarWow to sell your car the easy way. Just upload some photos, give a brief description, then dealers all across the country will bid on your car. It's easy.